Good morning. Welcome to God's house this morning here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. It's great to have this chance to be with you here as we gather around God's Word together. Also thankful that we have people joining us online as well. Uh, so it's, it's a privilege to be here with you this morning uh, as we continue the season of Lent. And we're, we're following the, the series called Crushed, uh, specifically thinking of, of Jesus crushing the devil. But, but today we're going to think about shortcuts, which when you're driving... I mean, shortcuts are kind of a win-win situation when you're driving, because not only do they save you time, uh, you're using less gasoline, uh, and you get there faster. I mean, it's, it works out great. But shortcuts in our spiritual life uh, is another way of talking about the temptations that the devil brings to us to try to say, you know what, forget all this stuff. Uh, I'm just going to do what I want. I'm going to take this shortcut that, that makes more sense to me at the time, for whatever reason, uh, so today we're going to re be reminded how, how Jesus crushes those for us also. Uh, so we'll be following uh, the order of service. Uh, you find it on your, um, your bulletin. It's also uh, service setting one in the hymnal. Uh, we'll begin then with our opening hymn, What Grace Is This? Please stand. Again, our service is in our worship folder and also page 154 in the front part of the hymnal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner.
our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to the body and all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And you may be seated. Our God speaks to us in his word this morning, first of all, through the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 20. And this will also be the, the basis of the sermon this morning. You persuaded me, Lord, and I agreed to it. You are stronger than I am, and you won out. I have become a laughingstock all day long, and everyone is mocking me. Whenever I speak, I cry out. I cry out violence and destruction. But the word of the Lord has brought scorn on me. I am mocked all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak in his name anymore, then there is a burning fire in my heart shut up in my bones, and I am weary of holding it in. I cannot. I hear many whispering terror on every side. Denounce him. Let's denounce him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying, perhaps you'll be deceived. Then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a terrifying warrior. So my persecutors will stumble, and they will not gain the upper hand. They will be put to shame completely because they have not been successful. Their eternal disgrace will never be forgotten. Lord of armies, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your vengeance on them, for I have laid out my case before you. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of the wicked. The word of the Lord. We'll continue then with our psalm of the day. It's Psalm 42. Uh, this version is not found in the hymnal, so please note you'll have to use the, the worship folder for this one.
Our God also speaks to us from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians, portions of chapters 3 and 4. And one thing that might tempt us to take a shortcut uh, would be the enemies of God and his word, uh, making us think, again, following God, it just isn't worth it. Uh, But here, Paul reminds us that, that our true home, our citizenship, is in heaven. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. The word of the Lord. I invite you to please stand for the gospel. Gospel for this morning is from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 13. And here, a strange place for Jesus to be offered help, I suppose, is the Pharisees um, who are telling him to get away from from someone like Herod. And Jesus realizes that's a shortcut. Uh, That's not a shortcut he's willing to take. Uh, He's going to stay where he is. He's going to go to Jerusalem and face death for us. Read from Luke 13. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated for the next hymn.
Come, let us reason together, says your God. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, dearly loved by him and called to believe and pass on the glorious gospel message. I'm just wondering, have you ever been shot at? No, I don't mean at the, at the beach with a water gun or, or a squirt gun. I'm talking about a gun. When you pull the trigger, there's an explosion and a bullet travels your way about two to 3,000 feet per second. Has that ever happened to you? I didn't think so. Me neither. But back in the 90s, I served a congregation in eastern Nebraska, and many of the men had been in the Second World War, and they had been shot at. And one of the most terrifying ways to be shot at was in the dark of the night, flying up at about 20,000 feet in an airplane, bombing the oil fields of Romania or the cities of Nazi Germany. Because the Germans had a terrifying gun called the 88. It was called the Acht Acht. The official name was the Flugamwehr Kanone, or simply the flak gun, spelled F L A K. Well, the flak gun was terrifying because no matter how high you flew, there was no place to hide. In fact, the U.S. airmen sat on lead shields to protect their bottoms. Would you want to take flak through the seat of your pants? When a flak attack started, they said it was kind of like six to eight foot tall, little puffs of dirty black smoke, almost pretty, kind of like the 4th of July, a fireworks show. But when the red hot shrapnel started to pierce the skin of the plane and then pierce their own skin, they said that the terror and the horror of being caught in a flak attack was almost worse than than the pain of that wound, because there was absolutely no place to hide in a flak attack. Most of you will never be shot at, but there's another kind of flak that you have to take. Christians routinely, every single day, are forced to take the flak of criticism and ostracism and discrimination and mockery, not with bullets, but with words. I know all over the world there are places where Christians are routinely locked up. Most of them are eventually released, but there are countries like Yemen and Iran and Somalia and North Korea where Christians are locked up and they never get out, they're executed. And if you wonder about that, there's a little magazine called The Voice of the Martyrs you can check out sometime that that documents places where Christians are executed. I don't want to talk to you about flack over there. I want to talk to you about flack much more close to home, right here in the United States. And actually, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus talks about those kinds of flack attacks. He says three times there, stop being afraid, fear not, stay the course, don't hide your message, and don't hide your Christian faith. Because if you stay true to me on the last day when I separate, the sheep from the goats, the believers from the unbelievers, I'm going to tell my Father in heaven that you are with me. Stay the course. I want to talk to you this morning about the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah had to take far more flack explode around him than you and I ever will. Let's take a glimpse at that prophet Jeremiah right now. Now, i got to warn you ahead of time, this does not read like a gushy kind of hallmark story that that will give you uh, wonderful, warm feelings. Just just the opposite. I've got to tell you that listener discretion is advised here because Jeremiah had to take flack from his own church body. God was very angry at his people. And so he said to Jeremiah, I love my, I love my people. God, God loved his people kind of like a, a mom or dad loves their wayward son or daughter. God said, Jeremiah, go talk to them. But first, go and get a clay jar from a potter. I'm angry at them because they've been burning incense to Baal and they've been sacrificing their firstborn sons in the fires of Baal. 
Now, I, I know that leaves you sick to hear probably 24, 25 centuries after it happened. Jeremiah went to his people after he got that potter's jar and he said, stop doing what you're doing. Stop burning incense on the upper porches to the star god. Stop pouring out wine offerings to Baal. If you keep doing this, this is what's going to happen. And he took that clay jar and he smashed it to pieces and, and he said to them, God is going to smash you. You will die. You won't even have a proper burial. The jackals and the vultures are going to eat your bodies and those of you that are left won't have any food and you'll be forced to eat the dead. And I know that leaves us shocked to hear today, but the people that originally heard it were livid. They beat Jeremiah. They put him in stocks. Now, don't think Wall Street here. Stocks were like wooden vices with cutouts for your ankles and sometimes for your wrists. They, they immobilized you. It was a form of humiliating torture where you couldn't move for hours. But the message was very clear. We are your masters. You must do what we say. We can deprive from you basic creature comforts like, like sleep and food and water and shelter and the toilet. Well, at this point in his ministry, the prophet Jeremiah was weary. He was tired to the bone of being used like a, like a human punching bag. He was sick of it all and very, very tired. And, and the, the stress, you can see, comes out in his words. We're going to take through this section of our text now. It's, it's Jeremiah chapter 20. We're going to be reading here starting at verse 7. And we're going to be taking a verse or two uh, at a time. And um, I'm going to read to you a translation that's a little bit different. This is the NIV, but, but you won't have any trouble following along now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jeremiah says, and again, the stress in his words, You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Well, maybe it's already happened to you what happened to Jeremiah. Maybe it was at work or at school. You were just doing your job and you had to take flack. People were very good at putting the guilt on you and they made something that was their fault sound as if it was all your fault. Now, now why does that happen? How does that happen? Well, you've got to understand that we're living in what's been called a no-blame society. Nothing is ever anybody's fault. Where did that begin? How did that happen? Well, it happened with Father, Father Adam, who said, Lord, the woman that you gave me to be my wife, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. But Lord, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my idea. It was her fault. That's the blame game. And that's what Jeremiah is playing right here in our text. And that's what I do and that's what you do. Because we too have a, have a depraved human nature that's hardwired all the way back to Father Adam. Well, he goes on in verse 8 and 9. Whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name... His word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Now, I think I would have had to say what the prophet Jeremiah said. Lord, I'm just doing your job. I'm your prophet. I'm just saying what you told me to say. And, and Lord, I, I don't do the stocks very well, and I'm, I'm, I'm really... Uh, not willing to get beat up anymore even for you, God. I, I'm just sick of all this. So, so Jeremiah finds himself in a terrible dilemma. He's, he, he's in deep despair because the people that he loves dearly are not listening to him. And if he waters down the message, he's going to risk losing friendship with God. And if he delivers the message accurately that the city's going to be smashed if the people don't repent, he's just going to take more flack and, and find himself beaten up again. 
And in fact, I think it's like 17 chapters after this happens, Jeremiah is back in a dirty dungeon, and the very next chapter, he's in a filthy cistern, forgotten and basically left to rot. Have you ever felt distress like that in your life? How did you handle it? Maybe the conflict was at work or at school. People were telling off-color jokes and you wouldn't join in. Or they were smearing somebody's name and you didn't take part in that. Or or maybe it was you wouldn't experiment with the illegal stuff and people noticed that and the people that you thought were friends slowly started to leave you and it got worse. And eventually the insults came your way and the mockery came your way and you had no friends at work or school anymore. How did that feel? Well, when that happens, don't forget what James says in his little letter. He says, friendship with the world is hatred toward God. He says, anybody that wants to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. But but I know, I know it's not easy, right? The reproach and the criticism and the flack, that all stings. And when that happens, do what Jesus says in Luke chapter 6. Hear his words. I think we studied this about a month ago. That was the blessings and the woes. Jesus says, leap for joy when that happens. Rejoice. He says, your name is written in heaven. This has always happened to God's people. They've always had to take flack. They've always been criticized. And if anything, this is a sign that your faith is genuine and real. But don't despair, because rejection from people that don't love the Lord is never, ever a failure. In in fact, it's just the opposite. It can be a blessing. When people do those things, when there's the bully at school who takes advantage of you, or, or, or the people conniving behind the scenes to get your job at work, or, or maybe it's simply people that, uh, that, that are mean, that, that have it out for you. Jeremiah gives us two wonderful promises to get you through those tough times. The first one, promise number one, is in verse 11. We're going to skip verse 10 here. Verse 11, But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble, I love that, stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. So when you face flack like Jeremiah, God says you're never going it alone. He says, I'm your Delta Force. He says, I'm your Navy SEALs team. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to protect your reputation, your honor. I'm going to protect your family. And this was the type of big-time promise that got that boy, David, through and made him a giant killer and made Goliath fall. I think we read that last Sunday in one of the lessons. It's a tremendous promise. God says, you will prevail. It's almost as if God is saying, I'm going to stick out my foot and I'm going to trip up those people that are coming after you. It's a beautiful promise. And then promise number two is in verse 12. Excuse me. Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance, your vengeance on them for to you I have committed my cause. So he's saying the Lord is constantly looking into people's hearts and weighing their motives and looking into the very deepest recesses of their hearts and seeing what's there. Constantly evaluating people. But he says, don't you play God. Don't you become the judge and the jury. God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. I'll take care of it. I'll I'll do that. And, and I think one of, the, one of the most beautiful examples of this is that Queen Esther, that Jewish queen, who became the Persian queen of the entire Persian kingdom. Remember how one of Esther and, and, and the Jews' enemies was Haman, who wanted to annihilate and totally wipe out the, the Jewish people, kind of like the Nazi Germans wanted to do in the Holocaust? Esther saw the vengeance of God. She saw God turn the tables and bring Haman to justice. The very gallows that that Haman created to try to kill the Jewish people ended up taking his life. She saw the vengeance of God. 
And that's why we don't do that. That's why we don't and can't look into people's hearts the way the Lord does. That's why there's no room for hatred or payback or retribution. Jeremiah is saying, let the Lord do that. Well, the section ends with verse 13, uh, kind of in a beautiful sort of doxology almost. Sing to the Lord, give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. So the Lord is saying, I'll take care of this. I'll do the payback. I'll bring people to justice. But in the meantime, I'm asking you to do something that's very, very difficult to do. I'm asking you to do what the Lord Jesus did when he faced his tormentors. I'm asking you to forgive the people that are throwing flack your way because in many cases, they really don't know what they're doing. And when you think about it, The Lord Jesus redeemed us and he brought us back to God by taking an enormous amount of unjust flack. He prayed for his executioners. He let a very close personal friend torment him. He suffered between five and seven unjust trials. When he hung on the cross for six hours, he took an enormous amount of mockery and criticism from many, many people but by taking all that flack, he brought us back to God. So our reaction then is is, is give him the glory. Praise his name. Glorify him in the songs as you're doing this morning. Understand that the Lord is, is not just the lifeguard of your soul, but he's the lifeguard of your body, and he's got a wonderful record of taking very good care of you when he sees people trying to take advantage of, of you. That's because you're the apple of his eye. You're somebody that he's going to come to and rescue like a mama bear comes to rescue her cubs when she sees that they're in danger. So when that happens, don't just take it for granted, but give him the glory. Amen. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Would you uh, please stand now as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And we'll continue then with our prayer of the church. Uh, We'll speak this responsive prayer together. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Strengthen and defend your church that by your word and sacraments faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all. 
Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. And hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. We'll continue at this time uh, by just taking a moment that if you haven't done so, please fill out the Connect card that you find uh, in each row. Those viewing us online can fill out the online Connect card also. And just as a reminder, the uh, offering box is in the entryway, uh, so you can use that if you'd like or, or give online if you'd like that too. Uh, we'll continue in just a moment. And please stand for a closing prayer. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll conclude our service uh, with our last hymn, I Am But a Stranger Here. Uh, you may be seated for this hymn.
once again. Good morning and welcome to Good Shepherd. It's great to be with you here today uh, to gather around God's word, word together and receive his gifts to us in that word. Uh, special thanks to Pastor Phil Spouty for uh, bringing us God's word uh, in, in the message this morning. Uh, Pastor Phil, of course, is a member here at Good Shepherd, but he serves our church body uh, as a giving counselor, uh, several different areas of our church body that he serves in that way. So really thankful to have him share that message with us this morning. A couple of other announcements this morning. Um, you know, we had different calls out, uh, and the one call that uh, had still been out at this point was for one of our, kinder, for our kindergarten teacher position, uh, and Marissa Oaks has responded to the divine call we issued her um, to be a kindergarten teacher, and she writes, My brothers and sisters in Jesus at Good Shepherd, um, you, the members of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church and School, extended a divine call to me last month to serve as one of your kindergarten teachers. Over the past few weeks, I've had the pleasure of talking with many people, people who care deeply about the mission of Good Shepherd Lutheran School, and also people who care deeply about the mission of my current call at Little Lambs Preschool. Thank you very much for your many great conversations, prayers, and loving encouragements this past few weeks. I've spent a lot of time in prayer and had many great discussions with friends, family, and fellow workers in God's kingdom. And after careful deliberation of both calls and praying where I can best serve God's kingdom, I share with great excitement and peace in my heart that I am accepting the call to be one of your kindergarten teachers for the upcoming school year. I eagerly look forward to serving Jesus alongside each one of you and teaching the love of Jesus to all these precious young children. I have been humbled with this deliberation and the plan God has for me as his vessel, and I ask that you please keep me in your prayers as I finish my school year at my current call, transition to Good Shepherd Lutheran School, and begin the upcoming school year. Also, please keep Little Lamb's Preschool and the Shepherd of the Hills congregation in your prayers as they call for a new teacher and continue their amazing mission to teach his little lambs. Thank you again for the trust and confidence you have extended to me through this call to serve your school. In the name of Christ, our living Lord, Marissa Oaks. Uh, so we give thanks for that, uh, for, for Marissa, and be sure to talk to her if you get a chance and uh, talk to her about that. Um, we do still have a first grade position that we're trying to fill, so we will be we sort of phrase it, we'll be continuing our call meeting for that, and that will be continuing uh, this Wednesday, March 16th. Uh, there is a Lent service that day, but it's going to be at 7.15, so after the, after the Family Faith Night um, has concluded, 7.15 in the gym, um, we're going to continue that call meeting to, to try to call another first grade uh, candidate for our school. Um, there's also, we're also planning a voters meeting, uh, it's, in a, it's in a couple weeks, Sunday, March 27th. Uh, at 6.30 p.m., the, the leadership team has been looking at the possibility of, you know, we're, we're going to be, um, Lord willing, finishing our, our parking lot, and that will be done, that huge project. But then there's these other maintenance projects that are, are sort of also now hanging out there, and what are we going to do? And so they're going to talk about possible ways to address uh, the funding of, those, of that maintenance project, um, including even possibly a mortgage refinance. So that's the goal of that meeting on March 27th. Um, is a voters meeting to, uh, to discuss moving forward with those projects. Um, there is an announcement from Mr. Scott Moss concerning our photo directory. So go ahead, Scott, when you're ready. Thanks, Pastor. Good morning, everybody. Just wanted to thank all of you that participated in our photo directory picture shoot. Uh, some of the photos have already been sent out, uh, maybe met, most of you have received your photos that, that you'd ordered. Uh, several people weren't able to attend the photo shoot due to travel or health challenges or just scheduling issues. So we're gonna have one more photo shoot on June 6th and 7th. If you weren't able to uh, participate in the photo shoot, please get a hold of uh, Dana, our office manager, and she can put you on the list and contact you when we get closer to the, the photo shoot. Uh, again, thank you, and have a good day. All right, thank you, Scott. Uh, with that, we also have uh, refreshments available today. We'd love for you to, to join us with those. Uh, be sure to greet people near you and, and far from you if you'd like, uh, but greet people uh, as we get to, to rejoice in, in being fellow sheep in God's flock uh, under the Good Shepherd this morning. So. Thanks. Uh, God's blessings on your week, and rejoice even when, uh, as we are told, even when we have to take flack, uh, we rejoice in our Lord's power and protection of us. Thanks. We'll see you again. <laughs>